then, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Yeah, they weren't kidding. Of the four elements, fire is the most problematic one. I almost gave up trying to justify it. But here we are. No bullshit, you wanna know about firebending, so here I am. Hi, I'm Thyme, and welcome to the last video of a four-part series on my version of breaking down the science behind Avatar The Last Airbender. I'll be skipping a few things that I've already explained beforehand, so to get the full experience, I suggest watching my previous videos on water, air, and earthbending. It has been a long and arduous journey, especially the video editing. God, the video editing. So thank you in advance for sticking around, and to close this off, let me bring you the single most dangerous type of bending, and what makes it so special that I had to put it in last. Ladies and gentlemen, firebending. the element of power. The people of the Fire Nation have desire and will, and the energy and drive to achieve what they want. Firebending, or what our world would call pyrokinesis, is the ability to control fire. This ability is strengthened during the day and even stronger during the passing of Sosin's comet. However, it's completely nullified during a solar eclipse. It originated from when the descendants of the Fire Lion Turtle people, soon to be the Fire Nation, as well as the original Avatar 1, learned to manipulate fire through dragons, though we're never really told how specifically. This ability is exclusive to the Avatar and the people of the Fire Nation. In terms of genetics, it seems there's a similar bender to non-bender ratio in the Fire Nation to the Earth Kingdom. That is to say, there is a moderate chance of a firebender giving birth to a natural born bender. Visit my first video to learn more about the genetics of bending. To begin with, let's ask this question one last time. What is it exactly do firebenders bend? Think about it. Creating fireballs and streams of fire from different parts of your body. Augmenting fire. Conjuring fire bombs, missiles, whips, pinwheels. Creating shields and walls of flame. Jet propulsion. Generating and redirecting bolts of lightning. And finally, blowing shit up with your forehead. It's understood in the Avatar universe that fire is the only element you can bend out of nothing. Although that's not entirely true, fire is, out of all the elements, the only one that isn't really a physical substance. Water particles are H2O molecules. Air particles are gaseous molecules in the atmosphere, mainly nitrogen and oxygen. Earth particles are an amalgamation of metallic and non-metallic compounds. But what are fire particles? There's no such thing. Fire is not a substance, it's a chemical event. Before we continue, it's important to understand fire before we understand fire bending. Fire is the observable outcome of combustion, which is an exothermic chemical reaction between a fuel and an oxidant. Exothermic meaning releasing heat as opposed to endothermic. Now the most common combustion is between a hydrocarbon and oxygen, resulting in carbon dioxide, water vapor, and heat. You've probably seen this in school before. Hydrocarbons are organic compounds that have hydrogen and carbon commonly found in oil, gas, coal, and organic matter like wood. Oxygen is the second most abundant gas in the atmosphere. When you heat these two up, the oxygen steals the carbon creating CO2 and leaving behind H2O, and whatever carbon remains just becomes soot. This reaction releases energy in the form of heat, and the heat combusts even more fuel which releases even more heat which creates even more combustions and now you have a sustainable chain reaction until you either run out of fuel or oxygen or the reaction is extinguished. During all this, the intense heat temporarily elevates electrons in any of the reactant atoms to a higher energy level, as in they jump from their shell to a higher shell, and as they return to their original energy level, they radiate light. This light is what you perceive as fire. This phenomenon is also known as incandescence, and it's the reason why hot gases and objects glow at all, including light bulbs. It's important to note that the fuel doesn't have to be a hydrocarbon, and the oxidizer doesn't have to be oxygen. Combustion can also happen by reacting oxygen with alcohol, metals, as well as other substances, and what you get out of this reaction will change depending on what your reactants are, so it's not always CO2 and water. Although oxygen is the most common oxidizer, with the 
right fuel, you can also create combustion with other oxidizers like chlorine. Here you'll see both ethyne and hydrogen combust in a flask of just chlorine gas, creating hydrochloric acid. Not only that, sometimes you don't even need a spark or high heat to trigger. Using a catalyst like platinum with methanol, you can create fire spontaneously. In fact, that's the principle behind your car's catalytic converter. Without sparks, it can combust the remaining flammable gases before they leave your car, therefore reducing pollutants. My point being, there are many ways you can create fire, but it is always created through combustion and it always requires an oxidant and fuel. Now look at these benders. Where are they getting their fuel from? Here's the composition of Earth's atmosphere. You'll notice that all the top gases are non-flammable until you get to methane, which is a flammable hydrocarbon, but that only counts for 0.00018%. That leaves two real possibilities. The first one is they're able to pull together flammable gases in the air like hydrogen and methane to use as fuel. Or even better, they make their own impromptu hydrocarbon. To do this, they'd ionize CO2, water, hydrogen, and oxygen in the air. Then they can steal their atoms to fuse together their own fuel, most likely an alkane like methane or propane, essentially doing a reverse combustion. If this looks familiar to you, it's because it's the formula for photosynthesis. This is also an endothermic reaction. It absorbs energy, so the bender would need to put in energy first to create the fuel and after the fire starts, in addition to giving their own energy, they can feed some of the heat from the combustion back into this reverse combustion to create even more fuel. The problem with feeding the energy back is the fire wouldn't be very hot because you're taking away their energy and it could possibly create cold spaces around the bender where thermal energy is lost. Not to mention there wouldn't be enough material in the air to work with for them to create fires this big. The second possibility, which may be surprising, is that they can literally conjure fuel out of nothing, as in they can spawn hydrocarbons by creating new atoms. This would make them the only benders that can create substances as opposed to using substances that are already there. Now create is a strong word. In physics, matter and energy are one and the same. Perhaps firebenders create fuel by changing the energy from their body into matter, energy people often refer to as chakra. They might also pull the energy from the spirit world. Heck, they could just pull entire flammable substances out of the spirit world through a wormhole or other quantum event into the material world. We don't know. It might as well be magic. Between the two possibilities, you have a choice between firebenders having the skills of an airbender when skill overlap shouldn't happen, or firebenders being able to create matter when other benders can't. Whichever the case, they're sort of breaking the rules of logical consistency in the universe, and that's why firebending is so special. I personally prefer the first possibility where they can create fuel through reverse combustion, but I'd say they're both equally possible and equally messed up. Alright, let's move on to how firebending works once they do have the fuel. As I've established in my previous videos, benders use a quantum physics phenomena called quasi-particles to draw energy from worldly events and channel them to create and manipulate fire using electromagnetic forces. For a more extended explanation on this, visit my first video on the series. In the case of a firebender, they harness the energy of solar radiation, the core of the planet, as well as Sozin's comet. We don't know if this extends to other celestial bodies like other comets, but it's not super relevant so we don't have to worry about that for now. Having access to quasi-particles, firebenders would be able to induce heat in both the fuel and the oxidant by violently vibrating their molecules using electromagnetic forces to the point that a combustion is triggered and the chain reaction begins. Once the fire gets going, all they need to do is keep spawning a steady stream of fuel and oxidant. We've also seen firebenders being able to heat up material without the use of fire, either through oscillation or inducing current in the material so they heat up due to their inherent electrical resistance. This implies they can introduce heat to many, if not all, physical substances. They may be able to redirect heat too to a certain extent, seen here with Sozin. Weirdly enough, it means they have a degree of access to the water and earth elements, as if firebending can't get more special than it already is. As to how they can direct fire, they can simply change the direction of their stream of fuel. This implies they can perpetuate motion in ionized air particles, possibly the fuel itself, using ionic thrust, the same way airbenders bend air. Visit my airbending video for more about ionic thrusts. This thrust, in combination with the expanding gases from intense combustion, is what propels firebenders when they use jets. It's not the fire itself that creates thrust, it's pressurized air, so in some respects, they're practically airbending. 
Some fires naturally form whirls because strong wind spins them around like a tornado. We often see this occurring during forest fires and volcanic eruptions. Whirling fires are hotter and carry more inertia than normal fires because they suck in the surrounding air, including oxygen. Using ionic thrust, firebenders can generate strong wind that would whirl their fires to make their attacks pack a harder punch. For complex motions like pinwheels and missiles, fire is a partial plasma. It contains a lot of ions that are susceptible to magnetic forces. Here's a video of a fire put in a massive magnetic field where the positive ions are pulled towards the anode and the negative ions towards the cathode, splitting the fire into two. Creating a trail of strong magnetic fields can therefore drag along a fire to wherever the bender wants. This is possibly the reason why their fires can collide with each other, because the magnetic fields that are guiding the flames also collide creating a repelling effect. Oh, and since fire gets weaker the farther they go, it's possible the bender just moves the point of combustion away from them to simulate a missile and keep the fire strong in longer distances. Okay, we know firebenders can create magnetic fields to dry fire. You know what else they can make with a magnetic field? No, I'm not saying... <laughs> I'll show you lightning! Lightning happens when an electric discharge occurs between a cloud and the ground due to a massive charge gradient. The clouds build up charge to the point that the insulating capacity of the air breaks down and electrons jump from the cloud to the ground, heating up air particles along their path for a split second. Much like fire, this is an incandescent event where the air glows because it's hot and we perceive it as lightning. For a firebender to create lightning, they need to charge an air bubble in their immediate vicinity, usually at the tip of their fingers, and create opposing charge at their target strong enough so the air insulation gives out and the charge jumps. They need to be very good at containing the charge, else they'll quickly discharge to whatever is nearby instead of the target. To help with this, and this may surprise you, they actually shoot fire along with their lightning. You just can't see it. Fire is very conductive because they contain ions. Electrical current always takes the path of least resistance, so whenever they can, they will seek out the fire in the air to follow in the flame's path. This helps guide the lightning towards the target and is also the reason why their lightning moves very slow. What's happening here is actually a firebender shooting fire at a target while creating a moving charge gradient, the anode being their finger and the cathode being the edge of the fire. As the fire expands, the cathode moves along with it. During this process, the bender keeps discharging their anode creating a constant stream of electrons. Essentially what you're seeing is not one bolt of lightning, but multiple bolts of lightning one after the other, following the path of the fire until the cathode reaches their target. No wonder they require a lot of time to build up the charge. The fire itself could only look invisible because of how bright the lightning is. They could be using hydrogen as fuel, which makes for a pretty dim fire, or even methanol, which is known to have invisible flames. Something similar can be seen with combustion bending, only without the lightning. Sokka, watch out! Ah! It's Sparky Sparky Boom Man! The combustion bender is actually shooting fire with such high velocity and pressure that upon impact, all this energy is instantly released. They're possibly using hydrogen or methanol as fuel since they're relatively invisible. It's either that or they're actually shooting the fuel onto the target and then combust them right then and there, creating the boom. Maybe that's why it's called combustion bending. But since all fire requires combustion, it probably should have been called explosion bending instead, you know? You know, I'm starting to think that name doesn't quite fit. Anyway, you can argue using this technique would have made lightning bending easier since the bolt will move faster, but in all likelihood, it'd probably be too difficult to do both at once. Before we wrap things up, there's one last thing we haven't touched. Rainbow fire is not fiction. The color of fire depends on what frequency the light is released with when electrons of the reactant return to their original energy level during combustion. Different chemical elements have a different number of electron shells and many electrons, and so depending on which shell and which electron, the frequency will be different, but they mix together to make one overall color. These metals, for instance, have different electron configurations and so they create different colored fires when used as fuel. Boron burns green, copper burns steel, and so on. Most firebenders have yellow to red flame because they're creating incomplete combustion. The yellow is actually the incandescent glow of the fuel inside the fire that failed to or hasn't reacted, thus incomplete. In an otherwise complete combustion, the fire glows blue and maximum heat is released, as you typically see in the hottest parts of a candle fire. 
Azula's flame is blue. She's either so precise with reactions that all her combustion is complete, which would make her fire extremely hot, almost as hot as she is, FBI, open up! or she's just using fuel that naturally burns blue, like hydrogen gas or something with copper or lead in it. These dragons could very much do the same thing. They use different fuels for the different color streams of fire, although that means they need to conjure them out of nothing because you can't pluck something like boron out of thin air. The only other way is they can directly control the energy levels of the electrons so they can create whatever frequency of light they want regardless of the fuel they use. I wouldn't be surprised if they can do this. They're mythical creatures after all, but this probably isn't the case for Azula. And with that, we have covered all our bases. Time to wrap things up. Firebenders are able to use quasi-particles to harness energy of the sun, the earth's core, and Sozin's comet. They can introduce and redirect heat to a wide array of substances. They are able to create fuel through fusing them from atoms in the surrounding air, the spirit world, or straight up creating matter out of energy. They can create controlled combustions and manipulate flame with moving electromagnetic fields in the air in condition to creating ionic thrusts, which incidentally also allows them to use jet propulsion. They can generate lightning by ionizing the air and getting them to flow through paths of flame. And they can concentrate their fire jet or stream of fuel before combusting them at a distance. Fire is the element of power, fueled by one's passion and rage. It is the art of aggression, but also the art of restraint. An exercise, if you will, of controlling your power and not letting your power control you. Congratulations on making it this far one last time. A lot of this video is inspired by an article by Zia Steele along with other sources, links in the description if you're interested. If you have any questions or suggestions, leave a comment down below. Otherwise, this marks the end of our journey into the physics of Avatar. Whether you've stuck around for all four videos or just dropped by here and there even for a few seconds, I want to sincerely thank you for watching or commenting. It means everything to a small channel like mine. I hope you've learned something and if you want to learn more about the science in your favorite show, feel free to subscribe. I make videos like this all the time. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like if you like it, dislike it if you don't, and see you next time.